Hi everybody, thanks for joining us for this PaintShop Pro Overview webinar. I'm Melanie Hyde, the Product Marketing Manager for PaintShop Pro, and I'm joined by Roger Wambalt, who's a Corel product trainer with over 21 years experience teaching Corel graphics products uh, to Corel software users as well as Corel staff. He'll be conducting today's PaintShop Pro training for you, giving you um, an overview of the interface as well as some key features and some different workflows. So before Roger gets started, I want to let you know that I'll be busy answering questions that you type during the webinar behind the scenes. Um, so feel free to shoot me any questions you have, and then we'll take some time to answer some questions out loud as well after Roger's demo concludes. And this webinar is being recorded and it'll be posted to our YouTube channel as well as to our Discovery Center. Um, the link is learn.corel.com slash webinars, and I'm going to drop this into the chat for you uh, as soon as Roger gets started too, so that you have that link. Um, please allow a day or two for us to get the webinar recording loaded to these places. If I've got it loaded to um, YouTube by tomorrow, when I do the follow-up email to you guys tomorrow, I'll make sure that I include that link for you. Um, lastly, we've got some great offers for you uh, as a thank you for attending this webinar today. So we're offering 40% off on PaintShop Pro 2018, as well as PaintShop Pro 2018 Ultimate, and that's for the full version or the upgrade version. Um, and we've also got 50% off any one item in the PaintShop Pro 2018 Welcome tab. So there's all kinds of brushes, uh, scripts, other creative content, as well as Corel applications. It just excludes third-party applications from that offer. So I'm going to send out the details um, of those offers so that you can redeem them in tomorrow's follow-up email as well. That's all I've got to say. So I'm going to let Roger take it from here, and I hope you guys enjoy the webinar. Thanks very much, Melanie. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as Melanie mentioned, uh, my name is Roger Wombold. I'm Senior Product Trainer. I'm going to go through this application. Uh, we've slated an hour and a half. I've got an awful lot of information to cover, and I do want to allow space at the, time, at the end for, for questions. So I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, what we're looking at right now is the welcome screen for PaintShop Pro 2018 in Essentials mode. Now, this is a new mode within 2018, uh, and I'll show that we'll, we'll slip into the complete mode very shortly. But the Essentials mode basically starts off with the welcome screen, and there's an edit tab. On the welcome screen, we have things such as start, I have what's new, uh, upgrade, learn more, gallery, and get more. That's very quick, I realize that. I'm going to go through that again when we get into the complete mode. To get into the complete mode, I'm going to have to switch over to the Edit tab. And when you install the service pack, if you install the latest service pack, it will automatically put you into the, uh, uh, the Essentials mode. To get back out of that, it's simply a matter of going to the File menu, down to Workspace, and select Complete. That's going to put me into the, uh, the complete mode. That's the mode I prefer to use simply because it gives me all the tools that are possible within PaintShop Pro. Now, as this is loading up, you'll notice I have a couple of dockers on the right-hand side or a couple of pallets on the right-hand side. Uh, for now, I'm going to uh, close off the Learning Center. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. And let me go back to my uh, welcome screen. You'll notice that I also have the Manage tab and the Edit. So let's take a look at, uh, at these various tabs and see what that's all about. Start off with is the start. This allows me to uh, go through, I can select recent files that I may be working with. I can select, uh, switch workspaces, create a new document, a new from template, or I can open an existing file that may not be in this list. This covers what's new in the application. I can click on Upgrade. So if I want to purchase the Ultimate Upgrade, uh, I can do that through here. The Learn takes me to a number of different tutorials uh, that I have access to. I can actually watch the video online. And Melanie mentioned the uh, Discovery Center. I'll show you that a little bit later on as well. So these are various tutorials that we have access directly within the application. Or uh, as we've said, you can go to learn.corel.com. Gallery is basically to give you a little bit of inspiration, give you an idea of the type of stuff you can do within the application, and just simply browse through there and give you some potential ideas. And of course, get more is what it's all about in the welcome tab as well. You'll notice that we have some filters here. 
I've got the special offers, I get more applications, scripts, uh, creative content, and I have the ability to scroll in through here. If there's anything in here I want to purchase, I can certainly do that. Purchase process is very quick and very easy. If I do purchase something, uh, it will say that's currently owned. Uh, there are some stuff in here that's free of charge. Uh, anything that's free, it'll simply say download, and it's simply a matter of clicking on the download. Creative content pack, KPT collections, and that sort of thing. So these, uh, there are some free stuff uh, throughout here as well that you can access. Next, we have the Manage tab. And on the Manage tab, once we get there, uh, it uh, gives me the ability to quickly manage my content. Now, you'll notice that I have this panel that appeared at the very beginning in the center. It's called our Guided Tour. This one particular uh, collection of Guided Tour panels, specifically for the Manage tab, talks me through the different areas within the Manage tab and quickly gives me a, an overview of what these, uh, these panels are for. So let me just go ahead and I'll close this off. Actually, let me go back one. I don't want to be in map mode yet. So I'll close this off. Down the left-hand side, we have our navigation. This allows me to browse to where my content is. Now, there's two ways of doing this. One is to click on the computer tab, and here I can go through various collections that's either on my hard drive, uh, whether it be on a memory stick or whatever the case may be. I prefer to use the collections tab, which allows me to browse out to my hard drive or various locations. Now, I'm going to go down to this folder. Uh, I've done a um, webinar similar to this before, and I've been asked by users at the end, where do I get this collection of, uh, of uh, folders and whatnot? <laughs> you can't. This is my own collection, but it gives you the ability to create various um, folders and store your content in. There's a couple of different views here. I have a thumbnail view. I can come up here and I can select uh, a full screen view, in which case I can uh, click through these images and take a look at them. If I double click an image, it'll open up in a larger preview. And of course, I can just close that off. The um, next thing I want to talk about is my map mode, which is right here. I'll click on the map mode. And what that does is it's going to change my display. It gives me a world map. Now let me just go into this folder of maps. You'll notice that I have little push pins on the map. This is indications to where some of these pictures have taken. On the right hand side of the manage tab, we have a palette that gives information about the file itself. So if I select this file, for example, on the general tab, it tells me the date it was taken. You'll notice I have a star rating. This gives me the ability to set a star rating for my images. If I've gone out, I've taken a two or 300 images, I can come back and I can say, well, I, I really like this image, but these are my favorites. We then have the ability to sort all my images by star ratings. I want to see all my images. And let's go back to uh, thumbnail view. I want to see all my images that I have as three star ratings. Or I want to see all my images four star ratings. I can certainly do that very easily. Let me go back to my map mode and I'm going to continue from there. Expand the particle shop, or the, the uh, TSP content rather. And so these uh, images that have a small red push pin, that's an indication that that image actually has GPS coordinates attached to it. And if I take a look at places, this is where the image was shot. I'm going to move my go-to panel out of the way. If I scroll down, I can see the latitude and longitude of that image where it was shot. Now, if you have a smartphone and you turn your GPS, in, uh, GPS on, it will automatically apply the GPS coordinates to the image. If you don't have a smartphone and you happen to know where the shot was taken, or maybe you have some shots taken there with and without, I have the ability of selecting an image and I can copy the GPS coordinates. I then can then go to another image and actually paste those coordinates on. We also have the ability to delete a coordinate. Now, if I've got a shot of, let's say, my, uh, let's say, first day of school, and I've taken shots of my kids uh, on the school bus at the school, I may not necessarily want that GPS information on the image. I, of course, have the, the ability to delete that. Uh, one more thing with, the, with respect to the map mode, you'll notice that we can actually see the map here. Now, if I go to satellite view, 
it's going to drop down and that particular shot is taken right here on the street if i wanted to i can actually jump down into street view and take a look at the houses on that street and uh, and see where that was actually shot and i just to turn that off and i can actually scroll around and that particular shot was shot in the backyard of this house so uh, map, map view is a, is a handy little tool. I'm going to uh, get out of my uh, map mode now. I'm talking about maps. I want to go to the edit tab. Uh, for the rest of this session, we're going to be spending time with the, uh, with the edit and uh, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at some of the things we can do uh, in this mode. So again, because I've switched to the edit mode, we have our guided tour. It's going to walk me through the edit tab and tell me where the toolbars are, my materials palette, layers palette, uh, all this sort of stuff. And then once I've gone through that, then of course I'm back in the, uh, uh, into the application. If I didn't want to see those, then of course there's a little check mark in the bottom left corner, and I should have shown you that, where you can say don't show this again. So down the bottom we have our organizer. You'll notice I don't have my navigator here. Simply clicking on this folder will allow me, allow me to show or hide the, um, uh, the navigator. If I don't have the navigator or, or, or organizer open, I can simply right click a blank area anywhere on a toolbar, go to my palettes, and I'm going to select organizer. From here, I can click on my navigator. You'll notice that we have a down arrow, a push pin, and an X. The X will close it. This will uh, hide the pain, and this will minimize it. This is a great way to give yourself more real estate when you're working within the application. If I click on the push pin, it collapses these pallets. If I need to get back to it, it's simply a matter of mousing over it, and I can go back, and it will bring up another image for me if I double click on it. So long as my cursor is here, it's going to stay open. As soon as I move my cursor away, of course, it disappears. I'm going to uh, <coughs> excuse me, leave this one open. And I'm also going to leave this open for now. Uh, <clears throat> let's start off with new document. So from the file menu, I'm going to select new. And in the new document dialog box, we have the ability of selecting different presets. So you have photo presets through here. I want to create an image that is a four by six image, and I can certainly select that preset. I have some paper presets some web if I want to design a, a web banner or something like that. Maybe I want to design wallpaper for my phone. I can certainly do that as well. And you can see that we have some different presets based on phone models. Cards and envelopes, presentation, and of course, social media. Uh, if I want to do any Facebook ad or a Facebook cover, then I certainly have that ability. You'll notice at the very top, I have user presets. Here I can set whatever size I want. And once I've created that particular size, let me just change this. And uh, go through all of that. And then it's just simply a matter of uh, saving that as a, a preset. I'm just going to uh, cancel out of this. <clears throat> Next, from the file menu, view from template. Now we have a number of uh, templates that are provided with the application. And I can uh, scroll through. And, uh, and see a lot of those. Uh, there's some that are for purchase as well. We also have some templates that are free of charge. So go through and uh, just take a look at the different templates. If you happen to want to use one for a, a third, this is here, for example, as a, a threefold or a trifold brochure, then uh, of course, it's simply a matter of clicking on download. You then have access to that template and to the content on that to use it the, the way you need to. Close that down. Now, I'm going to get into some cropping. We start getting into the, the tools within the application. I'm going to uh, close off these pallets. It's going to give me a little bit more space. First one I want to talk about is cropping. So I'm simply going to double click on this image. Now, I've done my uh, family tree a while ago, and uh, I was fortunate enough to get a couple of suitcases of old photographs from my grandmother before she passed away. And so in doing uh, the family tree, there's a lot of images that I had to scan in. Being able to lay them up four up at a time is a great time saver. If I come to my crop tool, 
I'm going to crop my first image, simply click and drag. And something uh, I think it's unique in PaintShop Pro is the ability to crop to a new image. Now what that means is that if I select this icon, it's going to crop that image for me. It's then going to bring back the original and allows me to crop the next image. In. So if you've actually scanned in four images and you want to crop them all out, this is a great way to do it. I don't have to bring back the original image or open up the original image again, simply to get that file back. I'm going to click on this. And then the final one, I'm going to draw a marquee around this. I'll crop this image. Notice that I'm going a little bit beyond the image. That's because it's crooked. Now I don't need the rest of this anymore. I've already copied those out or cropped those out rather. So I'm just going to click on the check mark and that will do the crop for me. Next tool down I want to show is the straighten tool. I'm going to zoom in so we can see this a little bit better. You'll notice I have a bar here. I'm going to drag this across here. And on the other end, I'll move that. So long as that's perfectly horizontal with this train bridge, I'm going to click on the check mark. And that's going to allow me to apply it. I can now grab my crop tool and effectively crop this out. And I'll click on that. Now, um, let me just check one thing here. I saw an indication on my panel on the right-hand side. My apologies. I thought there was a message for me. Let me get back on track. I'm sorry for that, ladies and gentlemen. All right, I'm going to jump down to this folder, which is perspective and straightening, uh, just to cover a couple more straightening uh, images here. I'll click on the leaning tower pizza. And if I select my straighten tool, you'll notice that I can also move this up and down. I grab the right position on that. I'm going to indicate what should be perfectly vertical. I'll click on the check mark, and then I fix the problem that the photographer created by taking a crooked shot. Just kidding there. Um, so straighten tool, very easy to use if you have an image that's crooked. As I say, simply uh, there's another view from that same bridge, a uh, different time of day, of course, but it's the same bridge, and simply click on the check mark, and that will uh, straighten that image. Also, under the straighten image is perspective correction. This is a pretty cool tool. I'm going to take this image, and let's say I was taking an image uh, from on street level, looking at this window box that's on the second story. It's at a bit of an angle. So long as I take these four nodes, I'm going to put those into position as to what should be looking at it square on. And I'll click on my check mark. And now I'm automatically elevated to the second story, looking straight across the, uh, the alleyway at the window, and it looks beautiful. I'll do one more. Same sort of thing. This is an image I shot on a, a wall in our office here. This particular image was done in Painter uh, by one of our Painter masters. And uh, it's an absolutely fantastic application. It, um, it's a digital art studio is basically what it is. Whereas PaintShop Pro is a digital dark room. allows you to fix pictures up and uh, do um, uh, remove cracks in an image, heighten, uh, red eye, blemish fixer. And we'll show you all that stuff. I'm going to click on the check mark here. And very quick and very easy. Let's process this. I'm now looking at it straight on. Let's get into a batch processing. A batch processing, for those who don't know what that is, is it gives us the ability of taking a command or a series of commands and applying it to multiple images at the same time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give all of these images a watermark. So if you do photography, you want to add a watermark, all you need to do is create a uh, transparent, uh, I'm using a transparent PNG. This is the watermark I'm going to use. I'm going to go to my file menu, down to batch process. Now I realize I might be going a little bit fast on some of this, but uh, this is being recorded, so you will have the ability to uh, review that later on. And actually, let me uh, go that a, a different way. I'm going to cancel this. I'm going to select these images first. I could have browsed to it, or I can also do it this way. Here's my images. Now the batch actions I want to do is I want to add a watermark. 
If I click on this, I click on my pencil, I have the ability to indicate what image I want to use as a watermark. Now I've already browsed, I, would, I probably should have wiped that out before, but what I did is I browsed where my watermark was, I selected it, I clicked open, and this is the watermark. I can tile it over the entire image in the corner. I also have the ability to set the size and I can do emboss as well as opacity. Bump that up a little bit and I do like it better in the center. I also want it a little bit larger. I'm happy with that. I'm going to click OK. If I wanted to add a picture frame or something else on the image, I could certainly do that. Uh, as I mentioned, many, many different actions you can do uh, when you do a batch process. I can save or load this batch, and I'm just going to click on Next. <coughs> Excuse me. And my destination folder, I'm going to set that to the process folder. I'll click OK. I'll leave everything as it is, but as you can see, if I want it to be a different file type, I can certainly need to do that. If I need to have JPEGs, or let's say they were JPEGs and I need PNGs, I can certainly do that as well. I'll simply click on Start, and it's going to go ahead and process that. Now, of course, if you're dealing three or 400 files, uh, that's the sort of thing where you might want to do it after dinner and then uh, go watch a show or maybe do it before dinner and go have, uh, have dinner, that sort of thing. I'm just doing it on a few, a few images. And so as you can see, it's very quick. When this is done, uh, I can simply click OK on this. You'll notice I have the ability to show up a report and it's going to give me a report of all of the process. I'll simply click OK. And now if I expand this folder, I go to my process folder, you can see that all of my images have the watermark added to it. One other nice feature is under the Windows menu, when I select close all, any uh, image that has a check mark in it, when I click on save selected, will automatically save that out. So it's a great way to do a, a batch save uh, on the images as well. I'm not going to do that here because I have other images that are currently open that I don't want to save. So I'll just leave that as is. Uh, enhanced resize tool, if I double click on this image and then I go to my image menu down to resize, here we have a number of different methods to resize this image. I can do it by pixels, I can do it by percentage. Maybe I want to do a print size. And you'll notice that there's some standard sizes in here. I want a four by six standard size. I can set the resolution, that sort of thing, and then simply, simply click OK, and it will modify that image form. So it's a great way to, uh, to resize your images. We've talked about the perspective uh, um, and, and straighten tool. Now let's take a look at the fill flash. Fill flash, for those that aren't aware of the term, is basically, let me grab my pick tool so we don't see the crop of marquee on there. Uh, fill flash is um, a, a photography term where if you have a subject with a bright light coming from behind, you're going to want to have a, a flash in front of your subject to fill in the shadow area. Hence, it's called a fill flash. In this scenario, uh, unfortunately, I can't really use this image, not until PaintShop Pro came along. From the effects menu down to, no, it's not. I always get this one wrong. Uh, from the adjust menu down to fill flash, it then allows me to increase the strength of the light that's hitting my, uh, my image. And as you can see, it's now brought detail out in here. I have the ability to adjust the saturation on that, uh, bring it up, bring it down, uh, depending on what type of effect I want to create. I'll simply click OK. And that, uh, so that works quite nice. Another situation might look at this image here and say, well, you don't really need a fill flash, but watch what happens when I adjust the, uh, add a fill flash to this. We brought that up and now we can see the texture in the fabric itself. So fill flash does really work quite well in bringing out the detail in an area that's a little bit subdued because of the lighting.
Uh, next we have is selective focus. Now, uh, selective focus is great uh, for creating what we call a tilt shift type of effect or applying focus to a specific area. From the effects menu down to photo effects and then down to selective focus. You'll see it here as well. There's quite a number of different photo effects that we have. I'm going to select the uh, selective focus. And in the selective focus dialog box, I have a planar focus. I have a half planar and I have an elliptical. And what I can do here is I have the ability of dictating whether my preview is in the or the control rather is in the before or after window. I want it in the before window so it's not obscuring what, I, what my results are going to look like. Here I have the ability to move this around. I can uh, change the shape of it, change the size. Uh, if I had this elongated, then I can rotate that. If I wanted to use that, let's say on a face, uh, then I can certainly do that. Now notice that as I'm doing it, it's actually updating on the right hand side here. I'm going to drop the feathering down. I don't want that bright color I want the color to be more natural and more closer to what the original is, then I can certainly do that. I can increase my feathering. I can increase my blur. And it really is a very, very uh, flexible tool for creating a nice effect and allowing you to focus on your object. I'll click OK to this. And I'll do one more with this image here. Now this shot, this is a shot down in Newfoundland. Uh, a former colleague took this when she went down for vacation. So if I go into my uh, effects, down to photo effects, and then into selective focus, here I'm going to use the planar. I'll click on this, and it might be a little bit difficult to see, but you can see I have some sizing handles here. I have the ability to rotate this. I want to rotate this a little bit. What I'm doing is I'm creating a tilt shift type of effect. And for those who don't know what that is, it basically gives you the ability uh, or gives you the illusion that it's actually a, a bit of a toy, uh, maybe a model train set uh, or something like that. So we can play with the focusing on that. And now I'm going to bump up the saturation. Let that process. There we have it. I'll click OK to this. And so now we've effectively created a, a tilt shift type of effect, which might be a little um, seaside village on my uh, model HO train set. It's a fun little thing to play with. The, uh, the next tool is the color changer tool. Now, color changer tool, a very, very powerful tool. It gives me the ability of uh, very quickly, uh, single click, uh, change the color of the image. If you want to do something like redecorate the house, maybe you want to change your room color, um, maybe you want to change a you know, paint color, buy a new duvet, wonder what color is going to go well on that. Simply take a picture and bring it into PaintShop Pro. And my color changer tool on the left hand side is located underneath my flood fill. And I'll simply click color, color, simply select color changer. Now, when I click on this, you'll notice that on the right hand side, I, will, I need to have my materials palette open. So, what I'll do is I'll right click, I'll go down to palettes, and I'll select materials. Now, I'm going to click on the color that I want to change. In this, case, in this case, I want to click on the duvet. And it's automatically changed everything to black. That's because black is the current foreground color. If I click in here, I'm going to change it to blue, to mauve, maybe to a bright red. You'll notice that when I select a color, and it's particularly noticeable for, uh, for lighter colors, you'll notice this area didn't quite grab it. The way to resolve that is I can bump up my tolerance. I can also click in this area again, and that will select that as well. So very easy to go around and get an idea as to what this is going to look like with different colors uh, on it. On this image, I want to change the young girl's headscarf. So I can simply click on here, and it's now changed the entire scarf. Let me do a Control Z, which is undo. I call it the oops key. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here. I'm going to grab my freehand selection tool. This is one of our masking tools. We've got a number of different masking tools. And what a masking tool is, 
Uh, in layman's terms, an easy way to explain it is you're going to paint the windowsill. You're going to take masking tape and you're going to tape the wall and you're going to tape the glass pane itself before you do the paint. The reason you do that is you want to avoid getting paint on the wall or on the uh, on the window itself, on the glass itself. So you're using masking tape to mask off the area and protect it. What I'm doing is I'm using a mask tool to mask off an area and protect it. In this case, what I'm doing is, because I haven't inverted my mask, I'm actually protecting this entire area. I only want to change the color of this object. I don't want to change the color of this portion. So we'll go back over, I'll grab my color change tool, I'll click in here, and now I've just changed the color of the area that was protected by a mask. And of course, remember, I have some area that wasn't completely done. I can simply click on that, or I can bump my tolerance up. To get rid of the mask, I'm going to go to the selection tool and down to, where is it? Remove mask with control D. There it is there, sorry. Select none. Uh, and so now that has allowed me to remove the mask and I'm ready to go with this image. Similarly, I've got this image here. If I wanted to color this object yellow, but I didn't want to color this yellow, then of course I would mask off that area. But now I've got myself a, a Caribbean style little villa or little shopping mall. Now, next tool is fade correction. At the beginning, I closed off two dockers. The first one was materials, actually I closed off three. Materials palette, my layers palette, and my learning center. If you go away with nothing else today, remember this, F10. F10 on the keyboard will bring up the learning palette of the learning center. Alternatively, I can right click, go to palette, and down to learning center. What the learning center does is it gives me uh, visual information on how to use a specific tool. You'll notice that if I click on here, this is my home button, it's organized in a logical fashion. I want to get more photos. I'm going to either import them, maybe camera memory cards, scan them, that sort of thing. I'll go to my back button. Now I want to do some quick adjustments to those photos. Maybe I want to rotate left, rotate right, or crop. If I want to crop, I'm going to click on the crop, and you'll notice that my cursor has now changed to the crop tool, and it's going to tell me how to crop an image. Let me go back to the home button. I'm going to take this old picture that was scanned in. I want to go to retouch and restore. So I've got some old images that I need to fix up. Maybe I've got cracks in them. Maybe I want to change colors. I want to smooth the skin out. In this particular one, I want to uh, fix or correct the fading. This happens very, very fast. I kid you not. Don't blink. Here we go. Ready? That's all there was to it. Single click, I've removed the fade uh, from this image. And uh, of course, I have the ability to adjust the amount of correction on that. I'm happy with that. I'll simply click OK. Not only is the fade correction tool good for uh, faded photographs, here's an image that I shot um, flying back in from a uh, trade show or a training session. This is just, just outside the, well, it's actually part of it. it's the Ottawa River. And this was shot through the airplane window. And you can see there's a bit of an atmospheric haze. Fade correction does a beautiful job on it. Simply click and click OK, and you're done. Uh, we have a, a local casino, Rio Carlton Raceway. Uh, again, another aerial shot from the plane. Fade correction. And I'm sure we've all seen this type of shot flying over the Grand Canyon or other parts of the big, beautiful US. Simply click on fade correction, and it really bumps that image up, makes it look beautiful. Very quick and very easy tool to use. One more thing you might notice is that I've been clicking on all of these images, but I haven't closed them down. We do a very good job of handling multiple images at the same time, keeping those open without causing the application to slow down. I've already showed you this once, but go back up to the Windows menu, down to close all, and here I have the ability 
to close any one of them and save it as I close it, or I simply click on close all, and it's going to close all those images for me. And I can now start from uh, from scratch and, and work on some more images. So let's just let those close for a minute or so. Now, one more thing is um, at the beginning, Melanie mentioned the uh, Learning Center. Uh, this gives you access to the uh, Learning Center. This is it here. Uh, to close it off, sorry. So this is the Learning Center over here. Uh, this is how we get back our guided tour. And I can select Don't Show This Again. I've mentioned that. So let me just close that off. I'm going to go into my background eraser. Uh, one more thing, sorry, one more thing with respect to the Learning Center. And let me bring up an image first. I'm going to uh, bring up this image. One more thing about the Learning Center. I mentioned that you can go through here. And if I select an effect in here, it'll grab the tool. Uh, conversely, if I select a tool in the toolbox, my Learning Center is going to change. And it's going to tell me how to use that tool. Coming here, I've got Gradient Fill. It's going to change and tell me how to use Gradient Fill. If I don't have enough information in here, I can click on more detail and it's going to launch the help book that, uh, that ships with the application, gets installed with it, and it's going to give me much more detailed information. So I'm going to open up my layers palette now. So I want to show you the background eraser tool. I'm going to go to palettes, down to layers. A layer, look at the layer this way. If you take a photograph and put it on the kitchen table, then you get out your plastic wrap and cut a piece of that and put that on top of your photograph, you've effectively added a layer on top of that. You're going to take some watercolors or a marker and you're going to scribble on that piece of plastic. You can then take another piece of plastic or plastic wrap, put it over top of that. You now have two layers and you can add other stuff to that, maybe a couple of stickers or whatever the case may be. So you get the idea, that's basically how layers work. Here we have the ability to add another layer and I can either Click on this icon to add a new layer. There's different types of different types of layers. I'm not going to go into the different types of layers and what they're for right now. Uh, I will be talking about the raster layer a little bit later on. Uh, another way to create a layer is to simply take an image and drag and drop this into my layers palette. So that's drop that down on top of this. I'm going to use my background eraser tool, and it's found underneath the pen. Very common question. How do I take Uncle Bill out of this picture and use him someplace else? Now, the background eraser tool is the one you want to use. And oh, the discovery center, or the learning center rather, is telling me how to do that. You'll notice that my cursor is a large circle with a pencil in the middle and a black tip eraser. If I left click, it's going to erase everything within the circle and it's going to pick up the color of what it should erase from that black eraser. So if I left click and I drag over here into the building, because my eraser tip is touching the building, it's removing some of that color as well. I'll hit my control Z and I can zoom around or move around rather. And so long as the black tip doesn't touch any of the building, I'll be good. As a little suggestion, it's a good idea to let my mouse button go once in a while. And that way, if I do accidentally pull something off, Control Z won't undo everything. One more thing is the Alt key and then left mouse click and pull the mouse towards me allows me to get a larger uh, cursor size. Move the mouse away is smaller. I'm a little bit larger. I'm going to left click. I go around here and very quickly remove all this information. And there we have it. So I've taken a fairly mundane sky, added a different sky to it, and added a lot of character to this image. Notice that the, the uh, tower antenna on this uh, church, you can still see that. So it didn't erase that. How cool is that? Again, take an image, let me just zoom right out, drag and drop it into the layers palette. And what I'm going to do now is in the layers palette, I have the ability to hide a layer by clicking the eyeball. I'll grab my pick tool. Let me make this a little bit smaller. And now I'm going to grab my background eraser 
zoom in a little bit. And I'm going to erase. around here and now let's just turn this back on with this object still selected I can grab my pick tool and I can move him where I want to and now I'll just put my text on here and I've created myself a little bit of a poster um, talking about removing objects there's a couple of different tools we have that will allow you to remove uh, objects from an image. The first one is Scratch Remover. So I'm going to double click on this image. That will open it up. Uh, this was an image that was sent to me uh, by a customer who wanted to learn how to uh, fix up old photographs. And he's given me permission to use this. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to take this image. Underneath my clone brush, I have a Scratch Remover and an Object Remover. Now, the scratch remover works similar to a clone tool. Let me go to the clone tool first. And the way a clone tool works is it allows me to right click on an area to select my source. And then as I left click, it's going to dump the source into that target area. So I did a control Z to undo that. I can right click here. And then I can left click over here and actually clone that source. Let me just do an undo on that. I'm going to come over here and we'll grab my scratch remover. Now the scratch remover, I'm just gonna click and drag. You'll notice that there's two lanes, one on the left, one on the right. The way this tool works is it takes the color, texture, and pixel information from the two outside lanes and dumps it into the center. It's a great tool for fixing scratches I'm going to zoom into here. I'll go right up here. And all I'm doing is dressing it up. And so as I say, it's a great tool. It's a little part between the legs, but we can get rid of that if I get a bit distracting. Very quick and very easy to remove scratches. When we get into a wider area, there's other ways to do it. I can make the brush wider, go straight up. As I get into different textures and different colors, an easy way around it is just use a smaller brush or do it in smaller steps. If I'm doing something like uh, the, the, the bride's face or the, or the dress, again, I want to go with smaller steps. If I go up here, I'm going to have a little bit of a problem in that I've wiped that out. So in this situation, I may want to switch to my clone tool. With the clone tool, again, hold the Alt key down, allows me to adjust that size. And what I'm going to do with this is zoom right in. I'm going to right click in this area. Just copy that over very gently. Right click. Control Z, that was wrong. I can go back to my scratch remover. And that brush is way too big. Oops. Now I'm not going to, because of time, I'm not going to go through the entire the entire exercise here. But you get the idea. Uh, some things you can do when you're when you're restoring photographs is uh, I could possibly, if I had a problem uh, with the eyes or the eyebrows, what I might want to try and do is copy this eye, mirror it, and move it over here. Sometimes you can get away with that. And then of course you want to do a bit of blending uh, with your uh, your clone tool. With the clone tool, you have the ability to adjust the opacity and that sort of thing. Let's move that back into place. But sometimes if my uh, toolbar get, uh, get out of place or, or I can't find something, let's say I've uh, undocked something or I've closed it off and I can't find it, uh, you may want to reset your defaults. The way to do that is from the file menu down to preferences and then down to reset preferences. In here, I want to reset general preferences. I'm going to reset my uh, workspace to default configuration. And there's other resettings I can do here. I'm not gonna worry about those. I'll simply click OK. It takes a few seconds to do that. And uh, it's going to go through. It's going to bring my toolbars back to the way I want them. 
the way I'm used to, to having those, and then I can continue working uh, from there. So just give it a, another second or so. And we're back. All we need to do is bring up my navigator again. I prefer to have that up there. Um, I mentioned the, I showed you the um, uh, scratch remover, uh, wrong image. The uh, scratch remover is also good, uh, not just for scratches in an image, but I can use it for um, power lines. So let's go to scratch remover. I don't have any power lines in this image, and that's too small. So let me bring this up to about 30. Let's bring that to a new. So not quite enough. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me try 125. We'll get that. So I can go through and easily uh, remove the bars. Uh, if I take a nice landscape shot, but there's a hydro line or power line going through, very quick and very easy to remove that. The um, another object removing tool. It's called, oddly enough, Object Remover. It allows me to select an area that I want to remove. And then on the property bar at the top, I'm going to select a source that I want to uh, replace it with. So I'll just resize this. I'll pull this in a little bit. And I'll simply click on the check mark. It's going to replace that. And it didn't. Well, isn't that odd? We won't worry about that. We'll figure that out and I'll let you guys know how it works out. <laughs> All right. A smart carver. Smart carver is a great tool for removing objects from an image that you don't want. Uncle Bill's in the image, you want him out of there. Maybe a seagull flew by or something like that. This is a shot I took at a destination wedding in Jamaica of uh, Jessica. Nice shot. I was bothered by these uh, balloons. If I go to my image menu, down to Smart Carver, we have these Getting Started palettes. Now, through the application, there's a number of Getting Started palettes. It's basically a one, two, three approach as to how to use a specific tool. I'm just going to close this off. And what I need to do here is I'll need to select the area that I want to remove. And you notice I'm not being super careful with it. And looking at the image, I thought, well, let's remove the tree as well. I'm going to increase my brush size. And I'll select my eraser tool. Sorry, <laughs> I'll select my remover tool. Uh, eraser tool would, uh, would allow me to erase that stroke that I created. Now that I've selected the area I want to remove, in a situation where something I'm going to remove is close to my subject I want to keep, I want to preserve or protect um, the, the image. So I'm going to just draw a little stroke here. And I want to auto contract horizontally. I'll click on background fusion. I'll click OK. It returns me back into Paint Shop Pro. And here I have my image. Uh, now I can sell this to the broom for a couple hundred dollars and make a nice little profit on it. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> Smart Edge is uh, gives me the ability to uh, paint or erase along an image without uh, covering into that image. Here's what I mean. I'm going to grab my paintbrush and let me just zoom into this area here. I want to paint the uh, the water here. If I drag my brush along, you'll notice it's very easy to go over and cover a piece of the hammock. If I select Smart Edge up here, this then will protect. Grab my brush again. There we go. This then will protect along here, and it gives me the ability to draw a cleaner line. Now, I'm starting to slow down a little bit, so let me just. Uh, Go ahead and just close some of these files off. But you see what's happening is it didn't go over top of the hammock here. It's going along that. So just bear with me for a moment. I'm going to mute my mic just to um, uh, take a quick uh, sip of water and I'll reset the, uh, or I'll 
close off all the uh, images as well. Stand by, please. All right, the next one is photo blend. Now, if you've ever tried to take a uh, Christmas photo with the family and uh, Jimmy's not paying attention or the dog runs in front of it or maybe the dog doesn't want to look at the camera, you end up with multiple pictures. Photo blend allows me to take multiple images and combine them into one. Um, I was playing around with my, uh, my uh, smartphone. I took all of these shots you've seen. 90% uh, of them are my own shots, and they're all taken with my smartphone. That's my that's my camera of choice. <clears throat> so my granddaughter was over one day, and I thought, well, let's have some fun. Uh, Nanny went out and bought her some dresses, and so she wanted to give us a fashion show. So I took a series of shots, put the uh, phone on the tripod. And if ever you're going to use the uh, photo blend, make sure your camera is on the tripod. You want to have a constant background. This is another Getting Started palette. I'll simply close on that. It's processing these images, and I can go through the images and dictate what areas I want to keep. So here, I'm going to set my brush in, and I, of course, want to keep her here. The next image, she's sitting over here. And one thing to be careful of, if you're doing something like this, if there's any strong light source around, it's going to cast a shadow Make sure you grab the shadow as well. Go to our next image. And notice that these two are now removed from there. That's because they're included in these images. So my next image is over here. And this is also a great way to allow you to inspect or review your image. Note that I have a little hole here. I'm going to come back here and I'm going to click on that. Alternatively, I could have switched the brush out and I could have selected there. <clears throat> the final one, she's just standing up here. Again, remember the shadow. Now, one more thing with respect to this. As I go back, keep an eye on the background You'll notice that the camera is fairly still. There's a bit of movement between this one and the other ones. So what I'm going to do is the three of them are similar to this one. I'm going to select this and I'm going to lock, put this lock on. What that's going to do is it's saying, I want to use this background image and give me the rest of the content. Now it's simply a matter of clicking on process or process. <laughs> and uh, it takes just a few seconds to go through and it's going to return with an image that will have um, four, uh, four subjects in that image. And there we have it. So it's a fun little novelty image uh, that I could use to give to her mom or she can uh, print out and stick up on her wall. If you're doing a, a, a Christmas image, uh, you know, for a family portrait, by all means, it's a great way to do it. We have a tutorial on the Discovery Center that shows that as well. I can save and close. I'm just going to close. That brings me back into uh, um, into Paintshop Pro. Okay, makeover tool. We're doing pretty good for time, I think. I want to. Um, I think we've got for another maybe another half hour. So I think we're going to be good for time. We're going to have some time for for questions as well, which is great. Um, makeover tool. So I'm going to open up this image here. And on the left hand side, toolbox, underneath my red eye, I have makeover. Now, let me go back to red eye. I'm going to zoom into this picture here. Simply a matter of clicking on the eyes, and I can uh, correct that. Notice that I've got a bit of the eyelid. I'm going to uh, undo Control Z, hold the Alt key down, make that a little bit smaller. And now I'll zoom out a bit. I'm using a roller ball on my mouse to zoom in and zoom out. Under the makeover, under the red eye rather, is my makeover tool. And the makeover tool in the interactive toolbar, I have blemish fixer, I've got toothbrush, eye drops, suntan, and something called Thinify. Yes, it's Thinify. So <laughs> let me go and grab the blemish fixer 
you'll notice that I'm going to make this fairly large for starters. Notice I have an outer circle and an inner circle, very similar to the scratch remover. The texture and color that's in the outer circle will be dumped into the inner circle. Hold the Alt key down, left click, move the mouse away from me, and it's going to change the size of that. Single click, single click, single click. That's all I'm doing to go around here and remove the blemish. Very quick and very easy. Works well for hot spots as well. Here's a hot spot from the flash uh, or maybe a bit of oil on the skin, whatever the case would be. I can play with the size of that. That to me is a little bit dark, but you can get the idea. Um, it's a matter of playing with the size and you can very easily remove the, the flash marks. We have the toothbrush. Adds the whitening. If your uh, intensity or strength is too high, you're going to get a calamine look on your face. I just do a control Z. In that scenario, you just bring the strength down. It happened that time because I actually clicked on her skin. So very quick and very easy to do something like that. I'll go back into the eyes. We have the eye whitener. And then the last one is Thinify. Let me open up this image. Now this bride definitely is not, uh, does not need Thinifying in my opinion, but just to show you how that works, it's simply a matter of clicking horizontally and uh, click and drag horizontally, and I can thin out the image somewhat. I'm going to do a bit of a makeover now with uh, Sarah. So I've got this image, and I'm just going to show you some of the tools we've seen already, just to give you an idea as to uh, what we can do with that. I'm going to start with the blemish mixer. Hold the Alt key down to change my brush size. And I'm going to go around and clean up that. That didn't work out quite well enough. I'll zoom in. Hold the Alt key down, make it smaller. And there we have it. So very easy to get rid of some of these uh, blemishes. I mean, those ones are fine, but just to, to show you how to do that. Next thing I want to do with her is I want to crop. Now, one of the things about the cropping that I didn't uh, discuss with you, uh, some of those that do photography and uh, do a lot with uh, portraiture and, and uh, a composition and whatnot, will recognize the golden rule or the rule of thirds. So we have that in there. We have the ability of turning that off and on. I can also rotate my crop grid um, as well. So I'm going to crop this. Basing that on the rule of thirds, it basically says try to get your center focus uh, in one of these quadrants and uh, you'll have a much more pleasing image. Let me make that a little bit smaller. And I've basically got her eyes through the center of that. I'm going to click on this and I'm happy with that. Now, one thing I want to do with this is we talked a little bit about layers. I'm going to go to my layers palette on the right hand side. I'm going to select U Raster Layer, and I'm going to call this Eyes. I'll click OK to this. And what I can do now is I'm going to grab my paintbrush, and I'm going to paint her eyes. So let's zoom in. The Alt key, again, changes brush size. And I'm painting them this, go, I guess we can call it turquoise green. It's actually painting on the layer itself. So this is my piece of saran wrap, my plastic wrap, over top of the photograph, and I'm painting on it. What I can do now is I can come over in my layers palette, and these are what we call merge modes. And what this is going to do is it's going to merge the information not the layer. Don't don't uh, think of it as combining it with the other. It's uh, combining one layer with the other. It's combining the content or merging the content with the other by uh, using a merge mode. And I'm going to grab color, and then what I can do is I can drop the saturation down, or the opacity rather. So I've now basically given her turquoise color eyes. Remember the color changer tool? Underneath my flood fill, I have color changer. I can now click on her eyes and click whatever color I want. So we can give her blue eyes. I can give her green eyes. I can change the opacity. Very quick and very easy to change eye color. 
going to create another layer. And I'm going to call this one lips. I bet you can guess what I'm going to do. I'm going to give her some lipstick. Grab the paintbrush. I'll zoom in and hold the Alt key down to change my brush size. Now, uh, this is not too bad. Uh, she doesn't have her lips parted, so you can't see teeth. Uh, if there was, of course, you wouldn't want to paint the teeth. Um, nobody wants to have blue teeth. I'm going to increase the size of that a bit. And I'll zoom out. As far as merge modes go, I used color last time. There's a number of different merge modes in here. Experiment with them. See what they can do. I'm going to drop my opacity down. I use the color changer tool. Click on her lips and then pick a nice color. If I wanted her lips a little bit deeper, a deeper red, I can certainly do that. Uh, here we a little bit more pinkish, but I can change the opacity of that, make them more intense, less intense. Very quick and very easy. Now, I'm going to uh, zoom out a little bit. I'm not finished with her yet. I've mentioned select the focus already. I want to uh, select my main image. And one more thing, when I'm doing editing like this, it might be an idea to duplicate the layer. And now I'm affecting the copy. I can turn off the background layer. I mean, I can turn off the copy as well. Uh, but this way, I'm not destroying or I'm not modifying the background layer. And it's a great way to see what it looks like uh, before and after. I'm going to come up to my selection, or up to my uh, effects, down to photo effects, and down to, there we go again, adjust, sorry, effects, photo effects, selective focus. I want to use the elliptical. And here, I'm going to elongate this. One thing I want to do right off the bat is drop the saturation right down. And I'll grab this little arm and I can swing that around. So we get a nice sharp focus here. I've got a little bit more feathered edge. We'll put a little bit more of this out of focus. I kind of like that, the soft focus around there. I'll click OK. I kind of like that. One final thing I want to do here is effects, down to photo effects, and I'm going to go to film and filters. Now, a lot of these dialog boxes that open up have this option in the upper right hand corner, preview on image. And that's a great way to see the effect a live preview in your larger image. Under film looks, you'll see that we have a number of different film looks. I can go with vivid color, I can go vivid skin tones, vibrant foliage, just depending on the type of image that I'm dealing with. Keep in mind that these are filters that would typically go on the front of a camera. We're putting them on the front of our image to simulate that. I want to use the glamour effect. It's added a little bit of a warmth to that. I can uh, come down to um, create filters. I can select cooling, I can select warming, and that's gonna add a color cast to that. Uh, if I find this too dark, I can drop that down. I can also, if I wanted to, click in the eyedropper in here, and that gives me the ability to lighten it here I can grab a different shade, different hue, uh, and now that's sort of a pinkish color. I'll click OK to that, and then the live preview, I can see that on the image. I'll click OK, and I'm done. I'm kind of happy with that, so I can then go ahead and uh, I go forth with that. If I want to see what it looks like the before and after, let's turn this one back on. So there we can see our before and after, the lens filter, as well as the soft focus. Um, magic fill, magic move, we're almost done. So I'm going to go into, uh, into here. I'll open up this image. This is a great um, um, technique. If I wanted to use this image as a background, I'm going to grab my selection tool. I'm going to select my clownfish. Now, notice I missed a bit of the tail. I want to um, 
add. So doing a little bit of mask here. And so it's now added that mask onto it. I'm going to click on the action, which is magic fill. It's going to take a matter of seconds. It's going to go through there. And it's going to remove my fish. And it's going to replace the background where the fish was. Control D will remove the selection. Or I can go up to selection and select, select none. Let's open up one more. We'll do one more with that. With this one, I'm going to use my freehand selection. I'll just left click. I'm going to drag around this area. Come to the end. I let the mouse button go. And I go action. And it's going to apply that effect. You'll see the green bar along the bottom. That's my processing bar. Another time you see the green bar, I may not be doing anything. What that actually is doing is it's creating a backup or a restore point for any images that I currently have open. So it's a great way to, uh, you know, if you happen to uh, uh, crash or close uh, the uh, power shuts off or something like that, it will create a backup. That's what's doing right now. It's actually doing the backup for me. Uh, time machine. <clears throat> Now, Time Machine, I think PaintShop Pro is one of the only applications that can give you a history lesson uh, when we uh, talk about, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a history lesson when we talk about photography. I'm going to uh, do a right click, palettes, turn in center. I'm going to go back to my home. I'm going to come down to effects, and I'm going to click Time Machine. Time Machine, as I say, gives you a history lesson. The first types of photographs were the daguerreotypes, widely used between 1839 and 1855. And this is typically what one would look like. So it gives you a bit of a lesson of the different styles of photography throughout the years. Here we have an albumin. Here we have cyanotype. My favorite is the platinum. So the platinum is between 1873 and 1920. Uh, some of us, myself included, may remember box cameras. So box cameras had a very distinctive frame around the perimeter of the, uh, the image. If I select preview on image, then of course I'm going to get the preview. And if I had it zoomed out there, there we are. I can see the, print, the frame around that. I'll simply click OK, and I'm done. I'll do one more with the time machine. I'm going to do this one. I want to create a haunted house type of effect. I'm going to use the daguerreotype. In this particular image, I don't want the frame. So I have the ability to turn that frame off. I'll click OK, and there's my image. So very quick and very easy. That's one of the nice things about uh, PaintShop Pro. A single HDR. Uh, I'm running a little bit low on time. I do want to save time, and I, I'm hoping that there's a lot of questions that uh, so I'm getting information directly to you folks. Uh, I've got to watch my time. So uh, HDR stands for High Dynamic Range. And basically what it allows you to do is uh, take a bracketing shot that is usually two stops underexposed, two stops overexposed, and a normal stop. The reason being is because, well, actually, maybe I should show the other one first. The reason being is if I, um, if I take two stops underexposed and I have some bright lights, those bright lights aren't going to be washed out. If I take it overexposed, then the shadow areas, I'm going to be able to get more detail in that. So here we have an underexposed shot, and I've got nice exposure on the lighting. This is overexposed, and I've got really washed out. I can select these three images, right click, sorry, uh, select these three images, and click on process, and it's actually going to merge those together. And so I have good detail across all the images. Let me do that once more. That was pretty. Uh, that wasn't very good. Let me just do that again. So right click, HDR, exposure merge. It brings up the getting started palette. I'll close that off. Here's my underexposed, normal exposure, and overexposure. Note the shadow areas here that you don't see detail. I select these three uh, and then process. What the auto brush is for, brush in and brush out, is let's say I had an aircraft flying by at the time on one of the shots, and I could brush out that aircraft. Here it is completed. I've done the, the, uh, the blend or the merge with those. 
We've also provided some uh, default um, artistic styles, if you will, and you're feel free to go through, look through those, and you may find something very, uh, very appealing or very pleasing. Text wrapping. So uh, this was a new feature, I believe, that we added in HR Pro 2018, was the ability to wrap text around an image. Um, now, for the sake of time, I'm not, I'm not a, a fast type of writing stretch of the imagination, so I'm just going to type in gibberish. But here I have the ability of grabbing a magic wand. I can select an area, and I don't know if you can see that, but it's actually created a mask marquee around this area. If I select my text tool, and then click on my document. And I can't type in te text, uh, I can't talk and type at the same time. So as you can see, very easy to type text in here. And it's flowing around the path. That's a great, uh, a great way if you want to do a brochure and maybe you want a speech bubble and the text in the speech bubble, it's a great way to do that. I can change the, uh, the font uh, the font size, I can change the, uh, the actual font itself, uh, grab something a little bit different. Uh, I have quite a few fonts on my system, um, but uh, uh, I can bold, I can do another in italics, I can change my font color. My stroke color, that is the outline around the perimeter of the text, I can change that as well, uh, do anti-aliasing, a number of other things. The uh, create as vector versus uh, create as a floating or selection, what that will allow me to do is if I create it as a vector, it will allow me to continue editing the text afterwards. And my last one, I'm going to bring up this. And actually, before I do that, let me just close off these other pages. The, uh, the last one is the, the text shape cutter. That's kind of a neat little effect. If you wanted to create a... Uh, a piece of text that has a, a texture in it from one of your photographs, then you can certainly do that. I'm going to open up this image here, and let me go ahead and open up this image. Now I'm going to grab my text tool, and I'm going to type in uh, Paul's character. Okay, I just gave it away. You can tell I'm Canadian. Let me go ahead and I'll resize this. So there's my piece of text. I can change my point size, I can change my font, uh, any number of things. I'll grab my text tool. I'll double click in here and I'll select my text. And now I'm going to click on this icon. What that's going to do is it's going to cut out that text from the image and create a new file out of it for me. And what I can do is I can left click on this. I'm going to drag up to here. Sorry, up to here and let the mouse button go. That now has put that in there for me. I'll grab my pick tool. Move that into place. And now any layer, if I double click on the layer, you'll find that I have additional settings in here. Under layer styles, for example, there's things I can do such as adding drop shadows. Um, I can do a, a bevel on it. I can do a uh, emboss. If I do the emboss, I can change the, the lighting. I can change the size, uh, opacity, do a number of different things with that. And it's actually going to affect the text. And that's it. Um, we're done. I'm done showing everything I need to show. Uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, we're going to uh, see what questions we have. Melanie, I'll throw it back to you and uh, see if we have any questions and we can go from there. Thanks, Roger. Uh, we do have some questions. We've got a question about the folders that you have um, in your collections tab. Uh, there's yes. a lot of people that have actually been asking where they find those folders. They don't have those folders. Their, their collections tab looks different. So yeah. do you mind explaining um, how that collections tab works and how Absolutely. you got your full? Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me open up an Explorer and that might, uh, might, think, uh, might clear things up. I mentioned at the beginning of this that this particular collection is my own collection 
And what I've done is I went into Paint Shop Pro, I, I created this content, and I've created a series of folders on my hard drive. And in each of the folders, I've put some of my images in here. Uh, so this particular collection you're seeing, they're my own images. Uh, simply, if I was to right click here, for example, I go to new folder, and I'm going to type in, let's do one so it's at the top, and go PSP webinar. And just for grins and giggles, I'm going to take this. Well, it's actually moved down now, isn't it? I'm going to take this here. I'll put that image in. And now if I go back to PaintShop Pro, and I will collapse this, and I may have to, yeah, I do. Uh, let me uh, right click and remove from list. So how I got that folder is I browse more folders and uh, it's doing a backup. It'll open up this dialog box. I'm going to go to my desktop where that folder is created. PSP content, I'll click OK. And here we can if I expand this now. This is the folder. Where is the folder? Am I missing? Oh, it's right here. Sorry. Um, this is the folder here that I just created. So that's that's my own set of collections, my own collections. These folders could be, uh, I've done a, a wedding and I've got shots of Jamie and Stephen and, and Terry and Mary and Paul. I can have folders with their names here if I wanted to. That's just a collection that I created. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, thanks for that, Roger. Uh, another question is, a, a few people missed how you were getting your navigation pane to show. Certainly. How you show and hide that. Yep, absolutely. So, by default, when you reset the settings, you have your organizer along the bottom. This little icon here, and if the organizer isn't there by chance, right-click anywhere on the uh, on toolbar. I've got to hide my go-to panel. Bear with me. Okay. Right-click anywhere on a blank palette. On a blank area, go to palettes and down to organizer. In the organizer, click on this little icon, the folders, and that will open up your navigator. I also covered the fact that if I push on this push pin, it will actually hide my navigator right there. If I mouse over, it appears back for me. So it's a great way to save real estate on the system. I can do the same with the organizer. It's hidden that. I can come back here, I can dock it again. I can also come here, put my cursor right in there, left click, pull it up, and now my organizer is a little bit larger. Let me open this back up again, and I want to push that. There we go. Uh, okay, something's happened there, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go on to the next question. <laughs> Sure. The next question, um, what is the best way to add a caption to a photo? Um, you have some smart shapes and some preset shapes over here. I'm assuming this is what you're talking about. Uh, and I can I can draw these shapes. I can then, as I was showing it just recently, uh, use the uh, freehand selection. If I click in here, I'll have a mask in there. I can then type in there. And that's allowed me to do that. The other thing, uh, when you talk about adding a caption, um, something else we can do is if I go over to the Manage tab and I select an image over here, under General, I have the ability to add tags and captions over here. This image, as I say, I shot with my smartphone, so the caption reads uh, Samsung. I could add a caption over here. And that information is stored in the exit data uh, on the on the file itself. So there's two different types of captions. I hope that answers it. Thanks, Roger. Um, somebody has asked, I want to put a photo in a circle. Is there a way to make a perfect circle? 
Let's go into the Edit tab. To uh, close this off. And let's experiment. So, ellipse, that's Canadian for circle. I'm holding the control, no. There we go. Uh, with the ellipse tool selected, hold the shift key down, and I can draw a perfect circle. Perfect. And how would you put an image in the circle? Uh, what I would do is from the selection, uh, I would, uh, I, I'd have to play with it. Um, I'm going to uh, create a mask out of this object and then use that mask to mask my circle. Uh, now, also, I wonder, again, we're trying something here. Can I do that? No, that's not going to work. I would have to play with that. Um, I know that we uh, we won't be able to get to all the questions, Melanie. Uh, and uh, as in the, excuse me, as in the past, um, I don't have an issue going through those questions and answering them. And then we can send out the, all the answers to the, uh, the attendees at a later time, if that's all right with you. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Did you want to take a few more um, first? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Perfect. Can you do focus stacking in PaintShop Pro? Focus stacking. I don't know what that is. So whoever asked that question, would you mind typing it into the uh, question panel again to elaborate? I'm not familiar with the term. That's okay. We can um, we can answer that offline afterwards and make sure we send out that answer tomorrow sure. with that follow-up email. Mm -hmm. um, what about... Uh, do you feel that you're in the position to explain the difference between the various layers, like vector and raster, for example? Um, yeah, there, there are some different layers in, uh, let me get to layers. There are some uh, different layers here. The raster layer allows me to create raster objects. Um, they, they, they are maintained as raster elements. Resizing them uh, is going to result in problems in that it's uh, you're going to end up with the uh, pixelated items and that sort of thing. A vector layer, the objects will maintain, uh, will be, uh, will stay as vector objects. And uh, so uh, editing and resizing those isn't going to be an issue. For example, if I was to, do I still have that other image open? If I was to create a preset, let me just close this up. I've created a new object. This is a vector object. And so in creating that, it automatically creates a vector layer for me. The advantage of a vector object is that I can resize this and I'm not gonna lose quality at all. And that's basically the difference between the, those two. The um, mask layer is just as it sounds. An adjustment layer allows me to make adjustments to my image and it's a non-destructive, so it doesn't interfere with the actual image itself. It's adding a layer of adjustments over and above the existing image itself. Perfect. Um, can grid lines be used instead of, or instead to correct perspective? Uh, you might be able to. Let me just uh, see if we can go view grid. Uh, I'd have to go into. Uh, I haven't gone down this road before, um, so I want to go into program preferences. I'd have to play with that um, to to set up the uh, the grid. Obviously, that grid is too tight to do any uh, perspective correction. Um, I'm going to have to divert that to later on to answer it later. Yep, no problem. Um, here's another one too, and I don't know if you want to answer it later. That's that's fine. But somebody would like to know how to blur individual faces in a crowd. Blur individual faces. What I would probably do is I would probably mask that face, and then uh, and then blur, add a blur effect to that mask. 
and then uh, undo the mask or you know, control D to, to remove the mask and then black mask the, the next area off and blur that. Uh, keeping in mind that masking, and let me just get rid of this, uh, this grid. Uh, masking protects uh, another area, protects an area of the image. So let me just uh, delete this. So I've masked this area and I'm going to go to selection, uh, invert, image, uh, I want to go to blur and blur. It doesn't really do very much, does it? That's okay, cancel, selection, invert. That's blurred that. Uh, Control D will remove that uh, selection. I'll select another area and then do the blur on that. Uh, and then just go around and blur the very faces. That's probably how I do this. Okay. And how would you create a layer with a transparent background versus a, a solid white background? Uh, click on the new layer palette, new raster layer, and there's my layer with, with a transparent background. There is no background to this layer. It's transparent by default. Perfect. All right, well, we've got just a couple minutes left now, so I'm going to, I think, call it quit on the questions for now. As I said, Roger and I will um, spend some time this afternoon working on answers to any questions that weren't answered. Um, either out loud or during the webinar when I was responding back. And we'll send out a link to those answers um, in the follow-up email tomorrow. I also want to remind you, you're going to get a link to the 40% discount on PaintShop Pro 2018 and PaintShop Pro 2018 Ultimate tomorrow with that email as well. Um, and the, a coupon code that you can use in the PaintShop Pro 2018 Welcome Book to redeem one item at 50% off. Um, and that just excludes third party applications. However, it is an additional 50% off that that coupon code is good for. So if there's something that's already on sale, um, let's say at, for 25% off, you'd actually be able to get it for 75% off. So it's a really great deal and I hope you'll take advantage of it. Um, a reminder that we're recording this as well. The recording is going to be available. So if anybody had any kind of sound issues or visual issues or anything, um, or you just want to watch it, pause it, and start it at your own pace and follow along, um, we'll try to make that video available before that email goes out tomorrow so I can give you a direct link to it. But in the case that we can't, I'll give you links to our YouTube channel as well as our Discovery Center where we post all of our webinars um, and then give it a day or two and you'll be able to find today's webinar there for your viewing. That's all I've got. So thank you so much, um, Roger, for your time today. I hope that this webinar was helpful um, regardless of what level you're at with PaintShop Pro and, and how much experience you have. And I look forward to answering all the questions that have come in. I hope you have a great day and thank you, Roger. Thank you very much, Molly. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Bye now.